It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All the sports news you need every day in under 20 minutes. Follow Locked On Today, today on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. You are Locked On Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, we are back for a Thursday Locked On Syracuse podcast. Thank you to everyone out there listening. We are here with you every single weekday, the only place for daily Syracuse podcast. Tim Leonard and Tyler Rocky. Been a lot of news this week. We've had Bayheim's Army went out and won a championship. Where's your Bayheim's Army things. buzz at right now? You still you still riding a little BA buzz right now? I know I am. I am, man. I I really the afterglow of this thing is it's it's been a big thing for me. I I don't know. I I just felt so much euphoria for Devo in that moment and, and really the whole team. I think I was more excited than I thought it was going to be watching I'm them with win you. that. What about and, you? And seeing everyone, the Twitter reaction, even a day, day and a half later. I mean, Kiefer Sykes still really into it. We got the the Kiefer, Swipe, uh, Kiefer Sykes quote tweet, actually. That's Indiana yeah, Pacers that. guard uh, Kiefer Sykes to you, my friend. And uh, <laughs> Jeremy Pope also interacting with us a little bit on, on Twitter. And you should follow us, too, at LO underscore Syracuse. Wow, what a plug there. That was phenomenal. Let's just stop the show now. That, that was seamlessly <laughs> Listen, that, done. That's by my you. good one for the month, all right? You're not getting another <laughs> yeah. good one until football season officially starts, until after Ohio. All right. Well, we will touch on some football stuff later on in the show. We're going to go to our number two most important running back. So, football fans, stick around for that. We're going to also talk about women's basketball news because they have a interim head coach I guess is the official tag they've tabbed Vaughn Reed the assistant moving up we'll talk about that decision what it means and if it was the right decision in a little bit but we begin on I guess kind of a somber note this came out a while ago though everyone knows Kyle Flip has gone to Duke he is committed at least to go to Duke and it was kind of known even a month before that he committed it seems like he actually made up his mind a month before reading through some of his tweets that the crystal balls came in about a and month the Duke earlier. Duke tweets too. Yeah, the I Duke mean, tweets. That's the, right. Did you see the thing where the, there was the ten light bulbs, and I yeah. guess Kyle Flip has ten letters in his last name, Filipowski. So if we were true social Sherlock's, we could have maybe deduced that. Although I will say yeah. this: sounds like tampering a little bit. Now, I, I don't. I don't want to be the the recruiting police here, but sounds a little tampery. I don't know about you. Well, it's it's the same thing that Syracuse football does, right? They The player tells the coaches, and then they go put out the orange emojis. And I guess for them, it's letters but in the name. But they probably for... already have a verbal commitment at that point, right? Like, I, I mean, there, there's something the in the works The player tells there. them, but it's not public. It's, I think I guess, it's the same yeah. thing. Like, there's a lot of times where we see those orange emojis, and then we go, all right, who is it? Like, everyone puts on their Sherlock Holmes hats and tries to figure it out from that point on. So... This one was a little bit different because that tweet that you're referring to where we're assuming that it was in Kyle Flip has basically confirmed this. He replied to the tweet and was like, yeah, like winky with an faces. emoji or something. Yeah. yeah, winky face, something like how, that. How all the young whippersnappers are talking these days, all in emojis. Yes. <laughs> like Brad, Brad <laughs> right. Beal, he put out the emojis the other day, like the, the curious face of uh, with the monocle and everything like that. And you just never know what these people are saying anymore. It's a yeah, new language. Like. It, this is just a, a an Apple version of Wingdings. That's what this is. Th- that's what emojis yeah. are. Maybe uh, Brad Beal can put out a little four-leaf clover for me to make me feel better about the Celtics not what getting anyone What about uh, some agency. gators, so, some alligators, the, the reuniting of him and Billy Donovan? How about that, huh? Hey, your Bulls have been making moves in free they have. agency. I know they this have. is a Syracuse podcast. We're getting off the rails, but... Shout out to them. So anyway, Kyle Flip going to Duke. The big question here, I guess, is what's next, right? Everyone wants to know, okay, are they still in the running for a center in this class? We've talked a little bit about Peter Carey, who is under the radar for sure, and a guy that's not ranked very highly, but we do like, and we think he should be ranked higher, and for a lot of different reasons, he just hasn't gotten a fair shake in this recruiting cycle so far. Hasn't gotten a picture on 24-7 sports yet either. Still working on that picture. (laughs) So some fans that might scare them off to those, I would say, actually watch his tape because I was in that group of like, oh, here we go. Another project center. And I'm not saying Peter Carey's going to be like 
I don't know, Fab Mello when he comes in or something. Like, he, he still has a long way to go. But when I watch his tape, I think he's a lot better than not having a picture on 247sports.com. Right. COVID hurt him a lot, it seems like. Between his high school season, his AAU season, hasn't played a lot of organized basketball in front of important eyes, it feels like, over the last year or so. So that's working against him. And he's also not on, like, the top tier of AAU teams right now. So we'll see what happens with him. But... The offers are starting to trickle in a little bit for him. So a name to definitely keep your eye out for. Yeah. Yeah, I think he'll continue to rise in the rankings. And Syracuse has done a very good job recently. I will say this, and this has been a good recruiting uptick recently. But even when the recruiting has been down, I'll give them credit. When they go after a kid who is low in the rankings and doesn't have great offers, it usually ends up being that they were just ahead of the curve. Donovan Klingon is a prime this class. example. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even, and I mean, look at the last handful of guys that have at least verbally committed. I mean, I think even back to Darius Baisley, I'm like choking up saying his name there, but he was a guy who hmm. was hovering around the top 50 and then became a top, what, 15 guy? Uh, even Benny Williams, he was around 40, and now he's top 25. And then you brought up the centers in this class, both Klingon and, and Flip. Yeah. There's a lot of names that are, are rising through. J.J. Starling, another one, too. Right. That one a little and easier. I guess, right, he's in your backyard there. But in, I think when we look at the rest of what could be this 2022 class, J.J. Starling, obviously Copeland, who is we all know is announcing his decision next week on August 10th, the Tuesday next week. So we'll be very keen to see that. And I think we feel still very good about that, right, right now, like just based on yep. what we're seeing. That's how I, I don't want to jinx it, but it, it looks good there. He's a guard. You add him to Justin Taylor, Kamari Lands. That's an excellent start that fans should be really excited about. And whether they get a big or not is going to be interesting Right now, it feels like Carey is a name to keep an eye on. There are a couple other guys, like Malik Brown did get an offer. He's a 6'9 guy. That was kind of a while ago, though, and I haven't really heard many rumblings around him. Maybe a listener has more information. Like, I I don't feel like they're pursuing him a ton. There's Duke Brennan, whose name's been mentioned recently. I'm sure there will be other guys that they will now target and shift their focus towards because they have time here, and that's the luxury of having a couple guys in the bag. You can sort of say, hey, come join Justin Taylor and Kamari Lance. We're building something here. So they got time, and I'm not awfully worried about the center position's future as is. Here's what I would say. Unless you find a guy that just knocks your socks off, don't worry about it right now. You don't have to worry about it right now. See what the development of Jesse Edwards and Frank Anselm brings you this season. And if you don't like it, hit the transfer portal hard. If you do like it, well, guess what? You've got multiple guys who who could be capable for you these next couple of years. So uh, you've got depth at the center position. How good is that depth? I think it's kind of a wait-and-see game right now. What is Frank Anselm going to bring? Will he even be able to develop this year now with Barama Sidibe back? And then Jesse Edwards, what's that next level for him? So let the season play out and then make a decision. I think... A, a big man that would come in at this point, I would want a transfer portal guy. That, that's what I'd be looking for right now if I was yeah. Jim Beheim. All right, guys, are you looking for a new car part or a way to repair your car right now? Well, I've got the perfect solution for you. It is rockauto.com. Different from the chain store fronts that are often kind of tireless and meaningless exercises, going to those chain store fronts and then getting turned away at the door because they don't have the specific part you're looking for. Instead, skip that step. Go to rockauto.com today. It's a family business serving auto parts customers online now for 20 years. If you go to rockauto.com today, you can shop for auto and body parts from hundreds of manufacturers. They always offer the lowest prices possible rather than changing prices based on what the market will bear like airlines do. I personally have used rockauto.com several times now. I can speak from experience, been happy each and every time. And when you go to rockauto.com today, be sure to write locked on in their how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you. Again, put locked on in their how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, and all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. I'm Kevin Ostreicher, host of the Locked On Ravens podcast and attention shoppers. 
we now have taste in the bread aisle, Dave's Killer Bread. That's right, an organic bread that doesn't need three spoonfuls of sriracha jam to delight your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is a 21 grain salute to the end of boring bread. A brand on a mission to make the most of every loaf, to rid the world of GMOs and artificial ingredients, and plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. But Dave's Killer Bread has done more than raise the bar on bread. In fact, Dave's Killer Bread was built on the belief that second chances can change lives when its founder Dave, the guy with a guitar you see on every loaf, returned to the family bakery after 15 years in prison. Dave took that chance and ended up creating what would become the country's number one organic bread while never forgetting his not-so-easy path. That's why at Dave's Killer Bread, they proudly practice second-chance employment, hiring the best person for the job, regardless of criminal background. And by the taste of it, things have worked out rather well. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. All right, so let's shift gears now to women's basketball because that has been in the news this week. We talked a little bit about it earlier on this week where Coach Q officially resigns. But then since we've talked, there has been another article from The Athletic that has come out. And I don't wouldn't say there's been a ton of new findings in that, but I'm sure you read it, Ty. There's basically it exacerbated more of- everything. It, it, it brought even more to the forefront, at least for me, of yeah. the, the neglect that was there and, and the amount it, of players that tried to say something and were just turned away right. essentially and ignored. I think it it felt more like a shot at the athletic department as yes. a whole for not seeing the tea leaves or not reading into this a little bit more. And it was a pretty damning read. I mean, I was pretty disappointed as a Syracuse alum reading that article. And then John Wildtack and whoever else was involved in making this decision tabs Vaughn Reed as the new interim head coach for, as he, as they put in this press release, the 2021-22 basketball season. So I read that and I assume he's going to be the guy all season long. I was pretty disappointed by that decision. I have nothing against Vaughn Reed. Actually, another, we, we got to know Coach Q a little right. bit too. And I was going to say, Reed, yeah. Yeah, he... He was we great Q, with us. Yeah, we got Q pregame. We would get Von Reed postgame. And, you know, it's it's funny because when you think about Von Reed, it was win or lose, he would talk to us. Yeah. Right? Like, it, there's no pressure in the pregame, right? Because it's a new day. You've got a chance to go out and win a, a basketball game. But after, you can get tied up in the emotion of everything. Now, in fairness, Von Reed and, and Syracuse did a lot of winning while we were both in school and were conducting yes. these interviews. So we often got a happy Von Reed. But win or lose... You would see them do the handshake line, and then boom, Von Reed would beeline across the court straight to our position and come do a sit-down interview with us. And he'd never miss it. And I have nothing but nice things to say about him. Sadly, just as I have nothing, but I would have had nothing but nice things to say about Q during my time in school and getting yes. to interact with him. But the issue here is, and why I'm a little disappointed in this, is I just don't think it sends the right message when there's so much being made of how you have this toxic culture and clearly you've ignored it for a while. To me, maybe you could make Vaughn Reed the assistant for a couple weeks, but they needed to hire someone completely outside of the coach Q tree as quickly as possible. And I'm a little disappointed that it seems like they're just bringing in or elevating the guy who was maybe you could say condoning coach Q's actions for all those years. And now he's just going to be the coach for the entire season. I don't think that sends the right message that you are scrubbing this toxic culture and you realize it's a problem. And I would say this. I don't think Von Reed's the head coach of this program next season because I do think that Syracuse is going to do the right thing eventually and clean house, clean slate with the women's basketball program because that's clearly what's needed. Now, how easy is it to hire a basketball coach even on an interim basis I mean think about what the word interim usually implies usually means you're already on the staff and Von Reed didn't step down none of the other assistants as far as I know have stepped down at this point so you kind of go I think in the, that in guy that is out uh Enoch the guy that was right. oh yeah yeah. Athletic mm-hmm. article. yeah yeah but, yeah you're right and and that's the thing is when you're Syracuse and, and you're right 
this article is really a, a shot at the the athletic department because the fact that all of these administrators were sort of privy to it and just wanted to sweep it under the rug because it was a winning program, it's it's kind of it's it's a really bad look. And it's not just John Wildhack. It seems like this stretches back through a couple of athletic directors and even some chancellors. Yeah, there was some Daryl Gross in there that was a little interesting. And I'd encourage anyone to read the article in The Athletic and, and read the one before that. That really was the bombshell that set this whole thing off. And I guess that's the disappointing part is it took an athletic investigative article to get us to this point. And you're right. I don't. It's a really hard position that they're now in, which I think is it's partially their fault that they've gotten in this position. But besides the fact now, just where they are right now in terms of okay, what do you do? Do you hire outside the family right now? How do you handle the next couple years? How do you handle the next couple steps? It's definitely hard to just impromptu like bring in someone that's outside the family and go through all the interviews while you're conducting an investigation. I get all that, but. I would have just liked to have seen Vaughn Reed in the press release say he's going to be our head coach for a little bit and we are actively looking for the right fit to fix this culture, basically. And probably a little bit better language than I just relayed that, but you get the point. And one of the things that is interesting, too, is remember back when the initial article from The Athletic came out, it said how Coach Q would sort of empower the the male head coaches. And Von Reed obviously fits that description there where he would not talk down on Coach Reed unlike he might talk down upon an, a female assistant. And you got to wonder, did, did Von Reed, was he one of those guys who felt empowered by the whole thing that was going on with Coach Q? And, and I'm... I, I, listen, I don't think Von Reed's going to be around very long. I, I think this is going to be a complete yeah, overhaul... And listen, this is nothing, again, Von Reed, again, for all yeah. we know, could have been standing up for a number of these assistants right. and and trying to empower some of the female assistants on the staff. And he could have been like, I mean, not that, that Bayheim has some toxic culture, but when when you hear about the good cop, bad cop, and with Mike Hopkins, like maybe Von Reed was the person that these players leaned in, leaned on in these times when when they were struggling. And who knows how it all played out, but hopefully this is a, a one-year thing and you can just scrub this program because there's a lot wrong right now. And the fact yeah. that a number of names that are even tied with the old regime are, are still on the staff, you you maybe didn't have much of a choice here, but it's it's hopefully a, a little one-year project and then, and then you can move on and make the hire. And I'm glad you brought that up because you're right. Von Reed could have been a guy that was coming to John Wildtack every day about Coach Q and saying, we've got to do something. Like, we just don't know. But why I say this is because I'm looking at this from a recruit's perspective. If I am a very good high school women's basketball player right now and I'm looking at Syracuse, I don't feel like that sends the right message to that high school player that they are just saying, oh, it's fine. Like, let's just elevate the assistant who was under this toxic culture the entire time. And it's a tough position for Von Reed. Maybe he is a good guy and he had nothing to do with this and it was just his boss that was making those calls and he doesn't want to lose his job and there's nothing he can really do about it. But either way, if you're John Wildtack, I would just really want to get rid of that culture and tell those high school recruits that, hey, we are not condoning that. It's not acceptable, these things that have come to our desk and we should have done this a long time ago. And we care about you as the players and we're a player first program. And that's how we're going to get back on track is by making sure that recruits know that. And the thing is, too, also, like if you're only hiring Von Reed for a competitive advantage, whether it's player retainment through this period, whether it's just having some sort of familiarity and, and maybe a guy you trust, if it's for a competitive advantage, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong because guess what? This program is probably going to take its lumps this year, regardless of who yeah. the head coach was. Well, even if it was Coach Q, the program was probably going to go through a little bit of a setback here. And then on top of that, if you are going to scrub it clean, you might as well start to do a little digging, see what's out there. Because at the end of the day, you're Syracuse. You're a power five institution in the ACC, a good basketball conference on the women's side, just like it is on the men's side. So... 
maybe start this this investigation or not investigation, this coaching search a little earlier. Maybe you get yeah. your person that that you want. Maybe you get out ahead of the the rush for the next trendy head coach, whoever it may be. If you're doing, if you're retaining Von Reed because you want to win a few games this year, you're doing it wrong, and, and it's a lack of morality by the athletic department if that is indeed the case. Yeah, and I'm worried that that might have been part of the decision. I don't know, but I think that's a good point. It's just it doesn't feel right that they elevated a guy from within the staff for the entire season. It strikes me a little bit as we got caught, but we don't necessarily feel like we were entirely in the wrong here. Right. Whereas if you come out and say, we need to change this culture and Von Reed might be our coach for a little bit, but we are really trying to find the next head coach that stands for what Syracuse athletics should stand for. And I, I maybe they just don't want to take that firm of a stance because of legal issues with Q or whatnot. I don't know, but it's just disappointing to me that they're not making that stance. Right. It's it's again, this should not be about winning and losing. This should be about riding the ship. So there is stability and and you're doing things the right way for for the the foreseeable future. All right, guys, quick break to tell you about betonline.ag, the fastest and easiest way to bet on your sports action right now. You got baseball season in full swing. They've got tons of games over there that you can bet on, tons of props going on as well. If there is a sporting event out there, I promise you, you can bet on it over at betonline.ag. They seem to have everything. It's a very easy-to-use website as well, easy to navigate, easy to sign up for that free account. It's totally free. And once you do sign up for your free account today, don't forget about our promo code that is locked on, all one word for a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Again, that promo code is locked on, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, all smushed together in one word for a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit at betonline.ag. What's up, everybody? Keenis Cooper here from Locked On ACC. And let me tell you about Sonos, the official sponsor of ESPN College Football. Experience the game like never before with Sonos Arc, the premium smart sound bar for movies, TV, music, gaming, and more. The precise and immersive sound of Dolby Atmos will make you feel like you are in the stadium. When the TV is off, stream music, Locked On ACC podcast, or even audiobooks from using Sonos app, Apple AirPlay 2, or your voice with Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant. Sonos works with all your streaming services, plus you can listen to thousands of stations free on Sonos Radio. Tune into the local stations, relax with your favorite genres, hear what world-renowned artists are loving, and discover new music. Arc was designed from the inside out for incredibly clear sound and rich bass, then fine-tuned by Oscar and Grammy-winning producers, mixers, and artists. True Play tuning software further enhances your listening experience by optimizing ARC's sound for the unique acoustics of the room. Don't wait any longer to get one of the best sound systems in the game. Go to Sonos.com to learn more. All right, time for our most important running back, number two, as we continue our countdown this week. And number two is the guy that is pegged as the starter going into this year Sean Tucker who was probably most important player on the offense number one last year if we were most talented yep a review Mr. Everything he was awesome he was the team MVP on offense also most important Twitter account of course we're huge fans you know that's why I'm excited today to have Sean Tucker because we get to tag him in the tweet and <laughs> that means we're gonna get the Sean Tucker bump. It's a little things. He he yeah. he loves. I'm not saying like he loves the pub, but he loves. Prom- I feel like it's more of like some athletes will retweet stuff, right? But he is he just actually does it in like, a polite way. Yeah, yeah, he does it in a way where it's like promoting the outlet that's putting it out there. Like, hey, go check out this article. It's not like. It doesn't even feel like the article is about him. It just so happens to be him that is blasting it out there. Yeah, and this all started where I think it was the first game he played in. He said, I made my debut. I ran for X amount of yards, and we won. Or It was just like such a right. friendly, like, I don't Little know. Little Magic Johnson easy, vibes, lucky but, way of tweeting but it. I loved it. I loved it. Like I, yeah. I hate Magic Johnson tweets, but I, I was endeared to, to the Sean Tucker Twitter experience. No doubt. And he is a, a Doak Walker watch list nominee this year, yes. which I... 
I guess 82 running backs get that distinction. So at first I was like, whoa, that's a pretty big deal. But I mean, that's a lot of running backs. Still, I think it's it's a big honor and it's pretty amazing because he's probably one of the younger running backs who received yeah. that honor. And think My about it question, too, in terms of the Doak Walker as well. When you look at across the country, there's a number of programs that have multiple good running backs, right? Yeah, and good point. I, I'm trying to think back through and maybe I'm forgetting, but... I don't remember Dante Strickland being on a Doak Walker list. I don't remember Mo Neal being on a Doak Walker list. I don't remember a number of Syracuse running backs getting on this list. And he is a yeah. true sophomore. He's not even a true sophomore. He's a redshirt freshman, technically, because everyone's last year was free. Right. So my big question for him this year is, I wonder just how much volume he's going to get, knowing that now you've got Abdul Adams and Jarvion Howard back in the fold. Cooper Lutz, we've talked about, is going to be a key player this year, we think. I mean, I look at Sean Tucker's numbers from last year. He got 137 attempts. He played basically every game except for the first game. He was 4.6 yards per rush, 626 total yards on the ground over the course of, I guess, 10 games, and he had four touchdowns. That feels like, to me, he might not hit those numbers again just because of the volume, but at the same time, I really could see him separating himself from the other three running backs because I do think where we stand right now and what I know about each of these players, it is Sean Tucker clearly number one for me. Is he clearly the most talented yes. in the room for you? Yes. Okay. I mean, you, you saw everything you needed to see last year. What he did coming out of nowhere and again if we were doing this list last year before the opt-outs and even maybe after the opt-outs he wouldn't have been on it and he came out of nowhere and put together one of the more spectacular seasons we've seen from a Syracuse running back he ran for over 100 yards three times to go along with a, a game where he hit 93 as well and the yards per carry was fantastic all season long he was able to get to the end zone and he could break off some big runs. I, I would love to see the the receiving game out of the backfield maybe expand a bit. But Yeah, because he's got I mean, good hands. It, it felt like he was Mr. Do-It-All, and you could feed him. I mean, you look at some of these games where he's getting 20-plus touches. The, there's a lot to like with Sean Tucker. And the other thing is, could it have been a worse season to be a running back, right? I mean, oh, new yeah. offense terrible offensive line you're always down in games so you're just not probably getting the ball as much as if you were up in games you're in an offense that is very easily predictable it's not like you're running creative run plays a lot to this guy I mean for how good these numbers are tremendous given all the variables that went into all the things that could have been stacked against him last year so I expect big things from him this year and if I was Dino I would still despite having this great running back room, I would look at the running back room as a huge asset, and I would say, okay, we're going to run the ball more because we have the opportunity to have more fresh legs back there at all times that are really good players. But I still want Sean Tucker to be the guy if I had to pick going into this year. And if he stays healthy, I want him to put up 600 yards or somewhere around there this year. Well, I think it really could be like 800 to 900 and it'd be a productive yeah. 800. And I know it's, I don't, I don't think this is the right word per se, but it would feel like an efficient 800 or 900. Like I could see his yards per carry going up. It was a really impressive 4.6 last year, but when you've got versatile guys and hopefully the passing game's going to be a little bit better, maybe improved offensive line play as well, maybe it's closer to five. You get up to the 4.849 range. Then you're looking at at a really impressive season and maybe one that could slot him onto the all ACCs. I think about where you've seen him slotted. A lot of them have him as sort of this honorable mention guy, as someone who could maybe take a pop and make that next step. Yeah. And last thing to say about Sean Tucker, what I really like about him when I look at his potential and his ceiling he played really good against really tough opponents last year. Two of his best games were at Clemson, where he had 10 for 63 on the ground and a touchdown. That's 6.3 yards per pop. And at number two, Notre Dame. Two playoff teams. Notre Dame, he ran for 101 yards. He caught two passes for 46, and he had a touchdown. He had a 40-yard run and a 37-yard catch against Notre Dame. That's really awesome to see because... You know, there's sometimes that a running back can have inflated stats because they just went off against Liberty or 
right. against Liberty is actually pretty good, but you get the point. Like he had a hundred yard game against Liberty too. Yeah, like all the good teams, he actually raised his level of play, which shows you that these stats are not inflated. Right. I, I, another thing I look at too is you look through his game log. He was shut down one time. I look at one game where he was shut down. North Carolina State, where he goes 16 carries, 18 yards. Outside of that, no one shut him down. I mean, he went up against some good teams, too, like you mentioned. He raised his level of play against the big boys, and he pretty much delivered every time you asked. And I would like to see the volume in terms of the quantity of rushes, not just for him, but for the entire offense, improve this season. And what's really going to intrigue me is how Sean Tucker's numbers will look if Garrett Schrader's the quarterback, a quarterback who's going to have more run design plays for him, as in Garrett Schrader's going to be running the ball a little bit more. So what's going to happen with Sean Tucker? Will we see the efficiency go up and maybe that yards per carry go closer to five because Garrett Schrader's got the ability to use his legs, or are we going to continue to see um, just Dino spread it out? Is it, is this going to be the the carry breakdown is certainly going to be something fascinating for me to watch here. And, and Sean Tucker yeah. figures to be a big part of that. All right. Well, we will cut the Thursday episode there. We'll be back for a Friday episode tomorrow and give you our number one most important running back who you can probably guess if you've been listening all week, but we will dissect that guy tomorrow on the show. Maybe even do a, a free for all Friday because there's been some news. We that should do a carry breakdown tomorrow. You want to do a carry breakdown tomorrow? Yeah, how, how the I'm carries in, are going to be split up and what is the, the most effective game plan for Syracuse in terms of yeah, getting the... and distributing the rushing because we'll wrap up the running backs tomorrow, like you said. And I think it is the most fascinating positional group. That's the million dollar Part question. Of, because yeah. of how strong it is too. No doubt. I like that. Good call. So we will talk about that tomorrow. We'll give you that number one running back and anything else that comes up. We are here for you guys to keep you updated on Syracuse Sports as we get closer and closer to that Ohio game. So subscribe to the pod, follow us on Twitter, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. This episode is brought to you by Spotify Greenroom. Have you ever listened to a podcast like this one and you wanted to bring up your own point or just chat with other people that are listening at the same time? Well, let me tell you about Spotify Greenroom. This is the first social audio platform made just for sports fans. The app is free to download, and once you're in, you can talk with us, other fans, athletes, insiders in real time about your favorite sport or team. Download the app, currently available on iOS devices, Create a profile, link your Twitter, join one of the groups for the latest league updates, and then you'll see us there. Spotify Greenroom, changing the way we talk sports.